Good afternoon, everyone, and, uh, and a very warm welcome to this inaugural event. Uh, as Tim mentioned, the University of Queensland, uh, primarily through the Business Economics and, and Law Schools, has been running an alumni luncheon series up in Brisbane for the last couple of years. Um, Australian universities have not been particularly good at engaging with their alumni. Uh, to be honest, we've tended to have taken you for, for granted and then probably contacted you 10, 20, 30 years after graduation and sent you an envelope and asked you to write a blank cheque. Right. Um, we, we realise that's a pretty hard sell after no communication between uh, your graduation and your peak of your career. Um, so the University of Queensland has really taken it on, on itself to uh, reach out and try and create a broader engagement. Um, the, uh, the strategy at UQ really was developed about four years ago. And we've been running a series of uh, networking events. Most of them started off very social type events. And then the feedback from the alumni was, can we have a bit more meat around that? And then the social events really developed into more of a PD type event. And uh, a sequence of uh, essentially meetings with our alumni, not just in Brisbane, but around the world as well, culminated in the strategy which was the advent in part for the campaign which went forward last year. Now, uh, I think nearly everyone in this room is a graduate of the University of Queensland and I think even being down in Sydney you probably will have noticed some of the publicity which came out last year that the University of Queensland celebrated its centenary. So 2010 was a pretty big year for the university and a number of familiar faces uh, in the room I recognise from events we held around the country last year. We then uh, finished 2010 uh, really having worked quite hard, having travelled around not just the country but around the world. I think alumni events were held on every major continent. And we got through the end of 2010 and said, OK, well, we've done some hard yards about connecting with individuals. We've really now got to deliver here and we've got to deliver on some promises in terms of our continual engagement, some promises in terms of um, service delivery, if you like, in terms of our alumni community. And so our faculty has taken upon itself to look at where we have concentrated uh, alumni groups and Sydney was a pretty obvious example for us. Right, so several of you I have met at various um, small social networking events over the last few years, but this is really our kickstart into uh, really the, the South and making sure that our alums in Sydney feel that we have not forgotten them. Um, indeed, we have not. Uh, and what we're aiming to do is to get down here at least once a year and if there is sufficient support from essentially the people in this room and the people that you know um, who are graduates of the university, then let us know and we will look at um, how we might ramp that up and really um, provide you with somewhat of a unique experience. I know that the universities here, uh, indeed I, I know my counterparts very well at Sydney University, Macquarie University, UNSW and so on, um, and, and they're doing some similar things, but I think UQ is slightly ahead of the pack and we want to stay ahead of the pack in that regard. Um, so thank you very much for your attendance. And we found in Brisbane that these, these events running a fairly short, concentrated lunchtime event where you can get a quick bite, um, but you also get some um, cerebral, uh, you get a cerebral menu as well after your sandwich. Um, so we, we try and get uh, a speaker of significant influence, a speaker of significant impact who talks not just upon a topic which is relevant to the business or economics uh, dimensions, although Malcolm can talk pretty much on anything I think nowadays. Um, it's a compliment, sorry. <laughs> uh, what, what we are trying to do is to put a speaker in front of you in a room whereby um, the speaker and the audience can have an engaging conversation and you leave that um, by two o'clock and you're back in the workplace uh, and you've really got a takeaway for, uh, for the rest of the day, if not the rest of the week. Um, so look, I know that many of you will look back on the University of Queensland with great fondness. It's still standing, uh, despite the, uh, the uh, adventure we had over January 10, 11, 12, up there in Brisbane. Um, for those of you who have not caught up with the news, the university is back open for business. Uh, 27 buildings were damaged, most of the sporting fields remain closed. Uh, the swimming pool is basically gone. Um, our, uh, some of our car parks are still closed, um, but we're, uh, we're essentially open for business. Um, some of you may have stayed in International House. International House is basically closed and will have to be rebuilt. So we're going through a little bit of pain there, but um, some of our colleagues out at Ipswich and in the north of Queensland are faring, faring far, far worse than us.
Um, in, just in relation to that, um, the Vice-Chancellor has an appeal out which is essentially around providing support for students. So these are students who um, had housing and um, that housing has now been closed and so they're in very temporary accommodation. Uh, accommodation around the St Lucia campus and in Brisbane is extremely tight at the moment. So if you, uh, if you do feel inclined to make a contribution to assist the current students up there, uh, just log on to the UQ website and you'll see the Vice-Chancellor's appeal. Okay, enough from me. Um, you're not here to, to listen to my propaganda. You are here to listen to the Honourable Malcolm Turnbull MP. And um, I think it's absolutely fantastic that Malcolm has agreed to give up his, his time. You can only just imagine the opportunity cost of his time. Um, and Malcolm is not a grad of UQ. We wish he was. Uh, he is uh, a grad of Sydney. <laughs> uh, but uh, he... Apart from his political career, and he's currently, I think as everyone would know, the Shadow Minister for Communications and Broadband. Um, prior to that, he was Leader of the Opposition uh, from September 2008 through the end of 2009 and the, the infamous one vote. But I, I thought it would be interesting to uh, just give you a little bit of background on Malcolm's career pre-politics. The, the man has had an extraordinary career. He's been um, highly successful. Um, his career has spanned journalism, uh, the legal profession, uh, merchant banking and, um, and obviously politics. He worked as a journalist both in Australia and the UK before he began legal practice in 1980. And uh, I think uh, one of the, uh, the more famous or infamous, depending upon how you might want to interpret it, was the defence of the former MI5 agent Peter Wright and the, um, the spy catcher affair. So uh, Malcolm was... Um, was defence counsel there. He then went on and established his own investment banking firm and he co-founded a number of Australian companies including Aussie Email, uh, which um, is, is quite, I, I'm not sure, Malcolm, whether that's a, a coincidence or by grand design that um, your current position um, is essentially the, the book end to Aussie Email to some extent. Um, he then went on and joined Goldman Sachs in 1997, became chairman of its Australian business before moving on to become a global partner. In 1997, Malcolm was elected to attend the Australian Constitutional Convention and was then, I, I uh, assuming, talked into uh, becoming chairman of the Australian Republican movement, uh, but led that Republican case with, uh, with great passion, as he always does in everything that he takes on. Uh, he subsequently published a book, Fighting for the Republic, in 2000. Malcolm is a grad from the University of Sydney and he is a Rhodes Scholar and I again thank him very much on behalf of both myself and the University of Queensland for making himself available today. Um, Malcolm has agreed to take questions after his presentation, so um, as he's going through the presentation, feel free to ask questions. Obviously, I think you will respect the fact that he is here giving a talk on a particular topic, and so I think it's appropriate that your questions basically be directed around that topic. Uh, will you join me in welcoming Malcolm Turnbull? <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Tim, and uh, it's great to be here uh, with you uh, UQ alumni. Uh, can I just congratulate all of you and the university, and you in particular, Tim, as the convener of this, uh, for organising this and similar events. I think one of the things we do uh, less well than we should in Australia is uh, connect with the alumni of our uh, great universities. The Americans, those of you that have been to college in the United States, you know, whether it's undergraduate or graduate, would know the Americans are remorselessly efficient at uh, engaging with and staying in touch with uh, their alumni right up to the time you uh, execute your will, in fact. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> So there is, a, uh, there is a sort of an agenda there, and Tim may have uh, hinted on to that, uh, on about that as well. But I think it is a really important uh, exercise. You know, one of the, one of the uh, uh, curious features uh, of, you know, modern society, and, you know, Robert Putnam most famously wrote about this in a number of books, most notably Bowling Alone, which some of you will be aware of, uh, is the decline of social capital. You know, we are not as connected with each other as we used to be, and which is a paradox, of course, because 
there is so much uh, technology and social media, in fact, that gives the impression of being very connected. But we seem to engage with each other on a face-to-face -face basis, in a physical way, <coughs> much less than our parents' and grandparents' generation used to do. Now, that is one of the reasons why uh, the membership of political parties is, you know, at all-time lows, uh, why in countries where they have uh, voluntary voting, such as the United States, um, voting is, uh, is at pretty much all-time lows. There is less engagement, and that's, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Uh, I think it's a bad thing. Uh, I think the more connected you are, and the more connected you are with people outside of your, uh, w you know, direct work. You know, it's no good being a lawyer if the only person you hang out with is lawyers, and some of the lawyers will probably reflect that's becoming pretty dull, uh, just hanging out with fellow lawyers. Uh, and the great thing about something like this organisation is that, yeah, you've all got the University of Queensland in common, but you've no doubt all got different uh, disciplines and professions and occupations and life stories. So there is a degree of what Putnam would call bridging capital associated with an organisation like that. Now, having said that, I didn't come to, to talk about social capital or Robert Putnam, so I'll stop doing that. And what I really want to talk about uh, briefly and then look forward to questions, and don't be, you know, you can feel free to ask me questions on anything you like and I'll, fee free, I'll feel free to answer only as many of them as I like. Uh, <laughs> it's two ways, uh, mutuality. It's, um, it's one of the issues in uh, broadband, of course, uh, to what extent is uh, connectivity symmetrical. Um, the <coughs> there's a joke for the engineers. Uh, <laughs> no engineers here today, obviously. Uh, the, the one of the questions a lot of people ask is, is how has the Gillard government or the Labor government got into so much trouble uh, in terms of their policy execution? You know, what went wrong? You know, this is a uh, big question. Uh, and I want to uh, give you a theory for that. I'm not going to insult your intelligence with a sort of a, you know, a ranting partisan speech, as so though you were a group of Liberal Party enthusiasts that I had to get revved up. Uh, I will give you a, what I hope you'll agree is a pretty objective uh, account. I will endeavour to be. I think when you, when you think about important policy measures, and that's really what federal government is all about. It's about reform, it's about uh, policy. Uh, state governments are very much more about service delivery you know, managing the public transport system, managing the water system. The federal level, you're dealing with big issues of national policy and because of the nature of the society we live in and the world we live in, that inevitably involves or should involve economic reform. So how do you go about it? Well, let's see if we can agree on the way you should go about it. I think the first and most important thing is that policy changes have got to be clearly communicated. You, you, th there's no point uh, being vague or ambiguous. You've got to state very clearly what you are seeking to achieve uh, and, and why. You've got to and identify what your objective is. Now, just in the, you know, the broadband area, uh, <coughs> what is the objective? One would assume, the government's never clearly articulated it, I might say, but one would assume that the objective is to ensure that all Australians have access to fast broadband at an affordable price. That would seem to me to be the objective. And that's one example of a, of a clear objective, uh, if, if it had been stated. The next step is that you're, having stated your objective, you've got to be able to justify it in terms of evidence. You know, Gary Banks, the Productivity Commission, uh, you, you know, I'd commend those of you that aren't familiar with his many speeches and articles, you know, uh, I'd commend you to read them. He is, Gary, you know, just hammers on and on and on about this. You know, th there's got to be evidence-based policy. You've got to ground policy in facts and in past experience and be very open-eyed about it. And if, the, if a particular approach has not worked in the past, don't do it again. Be pragmatic about it. 